Hello, everyone, and welcome to FallowSeminar.org, a project uh, supported by the Society of Systematic Biologists. Today is the third talk in a series of three talks on viral phylogenomics. Uh, two weeks ago, we heard from Eric Bowles, and last week we heard from Matthew Hall from Edinburgh, and those recordings are now up. They, they get some great talks, and today we're going to have David Rasmussen, who will be introduced by Trevor. Uh, so, very happy to introduce David. Uh, he did a PhD with Kathy and Cole. Uh, there's the video's off, isn't it? Yeah. So that's if you want to uh, turn it on. I see. Sorry. <laughs> uh, did a uh, did a PhD with with Kathy and Cole at Duke, uh, doing great work on uh, kind of very sophisticated computational techniques using uh, sequential Monte Carlo, which people in the phylogenetics world really haven't been doing until very recently. Uh, combining uh, trying to look at both surveillance data and uh, sequence data to get at phylogenetic patterns. Uh, he's recently taken a postdoc in ETH Zurich with Tanya Stadler and Sebastian Bonhoeffer, and he has to hear from you. Great. Cool. Okay, are you ready? Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Trevor and Eric, for having me. It's um, it's a real honor to be here, given that um, given all the people who have gone before me in the seminar series. Um, and like you said, today I'm going to talk about statistical methods uh, for phylogenetics, um, which is my little uh, area of expertise in phylogenetics. Um, but the term phylogenetics has been thrown around rather loosely um, in a number of different fields. Um, so I'm just going to start out by um, discussing what I think phylogenetics is. Um, I would agree with uh, most uh, other authors in the field um, who, to paraphrase them, said that phylogynamics is the study of how ecological and evolutionary processes act or interact to shape the phylogenetic history of pathogens. Um, I agree with this definition, but I think it um, defines the field rather narrowly. Um, so I would just say that phylogynamics is the study of how um, the natural history of um, a population of organisms in general, including ecological and evolutionary processes, shape its phylogenetic history um, for any organism or any population. Um, phylogenetics has also, um, or sorry, phylogynamics has also become sort of a shorthand term for doing inference from phylogenies uh, of demographic processes, what is known as phylogynamic inference. And this is basically uh, the inverse problem of what uh, phylogynamics in general is concerned with. Um, how do we infer ecological and evolutionary dynamics from phylogenetic trees? Um, but to start off with today, I'd like to give a very uh, broad general introduction into how we think about phylo uh, phylogenies and phylogynamics, including how we relate fundamental demographic and ecological processes uh, to a phylogenetic tree or genealogy. Um, I'll then move on to discuss some uh, statistical models that have been developed to uh, explicitly link the demography of a population uh, to a phylogeny. Um, and then I'll end with um, some more technical notes on how we can actually fit these statistical models to genealogies. Okay, to start with, um, I'm going to talk about just very, at a very high level, conceptually, how we think about uh, phylogenies or genealogies in phylogynamics. Um, generally, when we look at a phylogenetic tree, um, we think of that tree representing the ancestral rela relationships among uh, a set of, of taxa, or if the samples are collected from an individual population, then we might refer to that uh, tree as a genealogy, and we think about the genealogy as representing the ancestral relationship among the different individuals in the population, uh, or their lines of descent. Um, but as I'll try and show right now, uh, genealogies also contain information about uh, the demographic history of a population. This is uh, perhaps best illustrated if we consider a very simple demographic process in a simple clonal or asexual population, uh, so one where individuals can uh, simply be born or die over time. So if we start off with a single individual in the population, denoted by this um, gray circle here, uh, and it lives for a while, eventually it might uh, produce an offspring um, through a branching event or a birth event, uh, and live for a while longer, and then die. Um, and if we follow this process over a period of time, there'll be a number of births in the population. Um, and if we follow it to completion, eventually 
all of the individuals in the population might um, die or be removed through, for example, an invasive uh, sampling procedure. Um, and in this case, if we sample all of the individuals in the population at their time of death, or um, if we remove them through sampling, um, we can see that the genealogy, if we can reconstruct it perfectly from these samples, contains a great deal of information about the demographic history of the population. Um, so here, the genealogy that we, we would reconstruct is in red, uh, overlaid on um, the sort of true underlying tree process in the gray. Um, and we can see that from the genealogy, if we sample all individuals in the population, we know the population size through time, which is just the number of lineages in the genealogy through time, if, again, we have complete sampling. Um, and then, the, although the only information that we really lose in the genealogy is who gave rise to who. So we can't resolve parenthoods um, at the individual branching events in the tree, but we will have information about exactly when individuals were born and died. Um, but this is sort of an extreme case. More generally, in Filer Dynamics, we're concerned with the case where we haven't uh, sampled all individuals in the population. So here, let's just consider a case where we missed one single individual that we didn't uh, sample. Uh, we can still reconstruct the genealogy from the samples that we do collect, and in that case, it might look something like this. Um, and we can see that there's still um, information about the demographic history of the population. Um, we no longer observe all events that occurred in the population, or at least all birth events that occur in the population. There's certain branching or birth events that we don't observe because we didn't uh, sample individuals. But we can see for every single birth event that occurred in the population where we sample both the descendant lineages, so in other words, both the parent and the child lineage, we will observe uh, each one of these uh, birth events as uh, branching or coalescing events in the tree. Um, but in this case of incomplete sampling, we have to move from having complete information about the demographic history of the population provided from the tree to having to use statistical models in order to infer what the probable demographic history of a given population was given the information that we do have in the phylogeny. And this takes us into the second part of the talk um, where I'll, I'll discuss um, the two dominant modeling frameworks that have been used to probabilistically relate uh, the structure of a genealogy to a population's uh, demography. Specifically, what both of these methods or modeling frameworks allow us to do is to compute the probability of a particular demographic model or population dynamic history given an incomplete phylogeny. So first, let's consider the birth-death um, process or the birth-death model models. Um, in birth-death models, uh, the population dynamics are modeled as a stochastic process in forward time starting from some point in the past. Um, what's also nice about birth-death models is that they have also sort of a natural representation as uh, a branching process which generates uh, a random tree in itself. So it makes some sense that these birth-death models have also been applied in phylogenetics um, as uh, tr tree priors for a tree inference. Um, they also uh, naturally consider demographic noise in individual events, including the time of individual events, as well as the type of events, whether a particular individual was born or died, or, or dies or um, produces an offspring at a particular time. Um, and finally, a really nice thing about these models is that uh, under a certain cases, it's possible to analytically compute the likelihood of a genealogy under a birth-death model. Um, so if we consider a simple demographic process, like the one that we just look, looked at uh, in it for an asexual population, um, and we let the process run through time, and then when we get to the present, if we sample all individuals um, in the population at the, at the present time, and we reconstruct their genealogy, um, it becomes very simple to estimate um, what the birth and death rates are in this demographic model from the genealogy. Uh, in particular, we can actually uh, compute the likelihood of the genealogy given a particular birth rate and death rate. And this likelihood will just be proportional to the total birth rate in the population, or sorry, 
the probability of each of the n minus 1 uh, birth events that we observe in the tree, there being n total samples, there'll be n minus 1 branching events, uh, times the probability that each one of these branching events in the genealogy left behind exactly one offspring at the present, which I'm denoting by this probability um, P1 here, which you can see we can analytically compute below. Um, an important thing to note uh, about these birth-death models is that we're also integrating over unobserved events that might have occurred along branches um, that we didn't observe. So we might, there might be basically hidden branching events that occurred along branches that we didn't observe because that individual didn't survive until present. It died out before the present. Um, we can also extend these uh, simple birth-death models to look at cases of uh, incomplete sampling. So in the case where um, we haven't sampled all lineages uh, extent in the population at the present time, um, we'll also have to model um, the sampling process because we have to consider, uh, for example, the fraction of individuals in the population that weren't sampled, but it's still possible to compute the likelihood of a genealogy under um, incomplete sampling. Uh, actually, Tanya Stadler here at ETH showed what the likelihood of an incomplete genealogy is under a simple birth-death model with linear birth and death rates. Um, in this case, though, we have to consider the fact that there might also be hidden or unobserved branching events that occurred in the phylogeny um, that produced lineages that survived up until present, but these lineages uh, weren't observed in the genealogy because they weren't sampled at the present. So in this case, the likelihood of the genealogy is just uh, proportional to uh, the n minus 1 birth events that were sampled, lambda times a row here, times the probability that each one, oops, times the probability that each one of the branching events in the phylogeny left behind exactly one sampled descendant. And if any of these lineages uh, left behind other descendants, um, that they weren't uh, sampled at the present. Um, and I'm saying that the likelihoods are proportional here to these terms, because depending on exactly what we condition on, for example, if we condition on uh, the starting time of the birth-death process versus the root of the genealogy, exactly what terms uh, pop up or fall out of the likelihood changes a little bit. But uh, these terms that take into account the probability of the birth events and the probabilities of the lineages leaving behind uh, one sample descendant always remain. Okay, so that was the birth-death model. Um, the other sort of alternative paradigm in phylodynamics right now um, are based on coalescent theory or coalescent models. Um, and in, and in, to a certain extent, these coalescent models are very similar to the birth-death models that we just considered. Uh, they relate the demographic processes, um, the underlying demographic processes, to the structure of the phylogeny in a very similar way. Um, but in another sense, coalescent models are kind of the exact opposite of birth-death models because they're retrospective or backwards time, backwards time models of genealogies uh, where we generally start at the present uh, conditioning on the number of samples and the times of sampling of uh, the um, sample tips in the genealogy and then look backwards through time looking at the rate at which different lineages coalesce. Um, and until very recently, these models have only considered very simple, deterministic uh, demographic models, but in the last few years have been uh, extended to include more complex demographic models uh, as well. But uh, coalescent theory really got its start um, looking at very simple uh, demographic models, like the Wright-Fisher model from population genetics, uh, where um, in these models we have discrete generations um, and there's complete turnover in the population between generations. Um, so basically, individuals leave a random number of offspring behind in the next generation, and then they die. Uh, but the nice thing about these simple demographic models is that it becomes very easy to compute the, the probability of coalescent events occurring in the genealogy, which we need in order to compute the likelihood under a coalescent model. So if we consider two individuals that we sample at present and um, look backwards in time and ask what is the probability of these individuals coalescing in any particular generation, um, we can see that the probability of coalescing in any particular generation is just uh, one over the population size. And this should make some intuitive sense 
Um, if we're picking parents at random and we have one lineage and we ask what is the probability that some other lineage uh, randomly chose the same parent going backwards in time, that probability will just be 1 over n. Um, we can also ask then what is the probability of coalescing after n generations. In this case, that probability is just equal to the, the probability that the two lineages didn't coalesce for n minus 1 generations and then coalesced at the nth generation. So in other words, that the coalescent times in terms of discrete generations will be distributed according to a geometric distribution uh, with expectation equal to uh, the population size n. Um, and we can also take the limit in continuous time if the probability of coalescing per generation is very small, in which case we just arrive at the, the continuous time uh, analog of the geometric distribution, the exponential distribution. Um, so in other words, the coalescent times in the tree will be exponentially distributed according to some rate lambda, where lambda is inversely proportional to the population size. Um, and for generality, sometimes you see the coalescent rate lambda expressed as uh, 1 over the effective population size. This just takes into account the fact that um, the rate of coalescence might not always be equal to uh, 1 over the absolute population size. Things like the reproductive variation in the number of offspring each generation can either speed up or slow down uh, the coalescent rate. Um, but we can always just rescale the population size in terms of uh, an effective population size in these discrete time models to take that into account. Um, these coalescent models have also been extended to consider the case of time varying or fluctuating population sizes. Actually, this extension was done quite early on by Griffiths and Tavari in 1994. Um, in this case, uh, we can see that the probability of two lineages coalescing after time t uh, is just equal to uh, what I'll call the cumulative hazard of coalescing after time t, uh, where the hazard of coalescing at any particular time is just equal to 1 over the effective population size. Um, and so to make this a little more concrete, we can think of a couple different uh, demographic scenarios. One where the population size has been increasing over time, such that uh, the population size is large at present, and one where the population size has been decreasing over time such that the population size is small at present. Um, in the case where the population size is large at present, the hazard of coalescing um, in the recent past will be low because the effective population size has been high, and therefore most of the coalescent events in the tree will occur in the more distant past. Whereas if the population size is small in the present, um, the hazard of coalescing will be quite low, and so we'll have to wait, um, or sorry, the, the hazard of coalescent will be quite high because the population size is small. And so we'll see more coalescent events uh, towards the tips of the tree, uh, which should give you some in, uh, heuristic or intuitive sense of why it's possible to uh, infer changing demographic rates or de de population sizes from genealogies. Um, but these demographic models were still very, very simple. They just basically assumed that the population size was changing over time uh, due to some uh, external regulation that wasn't really uh, modeled. Um, more generally, we might want to consider the case where uh, the population sizes are changing um, in a sort of more mechanistic sense due to uh, fluctuating demographic rates or time-varying demographic rates, such as the birth and death rates. Uh, for example, this often comes up in epidemiology. If we consider a classic um, susceptible infected recovered model, um, the birth rate of new lineages we can view, just view as the, um, the rate at which infected individuals transmit to uh, susceptible individuals in the population. So the rate at which new pathogen lineages or infected individuals are born in the population will be equal to the rate at which transmission events occur, which will just be um, beta times S times I, the transmission rate times the number of susceptibles times the number of infecteds. So in this case, we can basically um, see that what we're basically interested in in a case where the birth rate of new lineages is changing over time, and so is the population size. And we want to ask, well, then, what is the probability of coalescing at a certain time, given this type of demographic situation? Um, and it's perhaps easiest to start by reminding ourselves that um, we'll only observe uh, coalescent events in the genealogy if there's been birth, or in this case of a, uh, epidemiological model transmission events. 
uh, in the population. So at large, in general, the total rate at which coalescent events occur in the population uh, therefore depends on the total rate at which transmission events occur in the population, which is just equal to the instance, or beta times s times i. Um, so then we can then ask, well, given a transmission event, what is the probability that any two particular lineages coalesce at that particular transmission event? Um, and Eric Foles did work on this starting in 2009. And what he found was that the probability of a coalescent event occurring at a particular transmission event was just equal to 2 over the total population size squared, which in our case is just 2 over the number of infected individuals squared. Um, and then combining these two terms, the total rate at which transmission events occur times the probability that uh, two specific lineages coalesce at a particular transmission event, we can find, uh, oops, we can find the pairwise rate of coalescence uh, between two lineages, which is just equal to two times the transmission rate or the birth rate over the um, population size. Or in the case of our epidemiological model, specifically, just equal to two times the rate of the tr which transmission events occur over the infected population size uh, squared. So this is sort of interesting because it shows that uh, under epidemiological models, um, the the rate at which coalescent events occur is still um, inversely proportional to the, the number of infected so the population size, but also depends on the rate at which transmission events occur or the instance. Um, and I won't say anything more about this right now because Eric Foles already went into this in quite a lot of detail in his Philo seminar. Um, so for right now, just to summarize, um, uh, we've considered both uh, birth death models and coalescent models, and there's a number of similarities between these different models. Um, both probabilistically relate a, path, uh, a population's demographic history to its phylogenetic history by relating fundamental demographic processes uh, like birth events and death events uh, to the structure of the phylogeny. Um, and both are able to account for incomplete sampling, and therefore we can use these methods um, to infer the demographic history of a population from an incomplete phylogeny using likelihood-based methods. Um, but there are some important differences between these birth, death, and coalescent models as well. Um, for example, birth, death models uh, explicitly consider the sampling process, or at least birth, death, sampling models uh, consider the, the sampling process explicitly, whereas under coalescent models, uh, we generally condition on the sampling events that occur in the tree. Uh, which, so depending on the uh, particular situation we're looking at, we might want to uh, choose one of these um, models over the other. For example, if we have no idea how uh, sampling has been performed, um, we might want to choose a coalescent model and just uh, condition on the sampling events in the tree. Whereas if we have strong um, or quite a bit of prior information about how the uh, sampling events or how sampling was performed in the population, we might want to use a birth death model to take advantage of that information coming in from when sampling events occurred. Um, and finally, another difference between birth death and coalescent models is that um, birth death models have classically um, been used to model demographic stochasticity, whereas coalescent uh, models have typically assumed deterministic population sizes. Um, and, but what I'll look at next in this talk is um, one way in which it's possible to actually extend uh, statistical methods to include... So, David, can I yeah. ask a question? So, it seems like uh, if you have kind of the, maybe the obvious thing would be if you have something where you've well sampled the, the epidemic, you want a, a birth death model where your sampling fraction is rather than 1% or something is, is 50% versus you don't want the coalescent model if you don't, if you, so I'm not even thinking of kind of uh, if you can characterize the sampling fraction, but it doesn't matter if, if the sampling fraction is really, really small for the birth death models. Um, you just use well, like for flu, for example, or something where you, um, or measles, where you, you don't have a lot of cases. I, so in the, the case where, um, sampling uh, occurs at the present time, it's actually not possible to simultaneously infer sort of like the birth rates, the death rates, and the sampling uh, uh, rate at a particular time. Uh, so generally we would have to have prior information about the, the sampling rate in order to actually estimate the, the birth and the death rates. Um, but in the case where sampling is being performed over time, 
um, we can actually estimate what the sampling fraction is uh, as well. But we still might want to know something about how sampling is being performed before we switch to the birth death model. For example, um, if we know that sampling, sampling fractions have remained relatively constant through time, then we might just want to use a birth death model that has a constant sampling fraction. But if we have prior information that says that while well, the sampling fraction might have been highly varying over time and we don't really know how the sampling fraction was changing relative to the population size, then we just might want to use a coalescent model where we condition on uh, the samples in the tree. Cool. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's, there's a couple of differences between these different models, the big ones being the how we treat sampling and the fact that coalescent models have typically uh, excluded sort of demographic stochasticity, but I'll explain in the next part of the talk how we can incorporate demographic stochasticity into coalescent models as well. Um, so for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about basically statistical methods that we can use to fit these types of phylogenetic models to phylogenies to basically extrapolate from the incomplete phylogeny what the demographic history of the population um, might have been in the past in a somewhat statistically rigorous manner, hopefully. Um, so uh, I'll start this section by noting that under uh, a large number of phylogynamic models, classic sort of coalescent and birth death models, it's possible to analytically compute the likelihood of a genealogy um, given the model. So this is the case for linear birth death models um, as well as several coalescent models with simple deterministic population dynamics. Um, but what I'm going to consider is sort of the more interesting cases where we don't know how to compute likelihoods analytically. Um, and this arises for many nonlinear birth death models as well as coalescent models uh, with stochastic population dynamics or nonlinear population dynamics as well. Um, and over the next five or ten minutes, I'm going to say uh, quite often that we can't compute certain likelihoods. And the reason, fundamentally, why we most often can't compute these likelihoods is that under these more complex demographic models, there's no closed form or analytical solution to the forward time population dynamics in the model. So there's no way of computing the likelihood of the genealogy as well. So we need slightly more sophisticated statistical methods. Um, to motivate this, this section with something concrete, um, let's just consider uh, another SIR model, in this case uh, a stochastic SIR model, uh, where the number of infecteds is now a random variable, and there's now noise in the transmission process. So here I'm just modeling noise in the transmission process through adding some random variate um, that adds uh, random Gaussian noise into the transmission process which implies then that the number of infected is a continuous variable through time and that we're treating this basically as a stochastic differential equation with Gaussian noise. But I want to make it really clear that actually it doesn't really matter how we're adding uh, stochasticity into the models. What's really important here is that with any sort of stochasticity, our state variables in our models, our state variable in our models become random variables. So for an SIR model, our susceptible infected and recovered numbers become random variables. Um, and what's important here for phylogynamic inference is that these state variables enter into the coalescent likelihoods if we're trying to fit these models to coalescent methods. Um, so then what we have to do in order to fit these models is we have to jointly infer the unobserved state vari variables along with the model parameters in order to be able to compute these likelihoods. And this is essentially the central problem with inference in phylodynamics. Um, we have a, a partially observed genealogy, which might tell us something about how the number of individuals in our population has changed over time. But we don't have complete information about how population sizes have changed. And there might also be additional, what we call latent variables, like the number of susceptible individuals in our population, where the genealogy provides no direct information about these variables. So we'll have to impute these latent variables from the genealogy as well. So to state this more formally, in, um, in a Bayesian framework, what we're interested in is then um, finding the joint posterior density of the state variables, our S's and I's and R's, and the parameters of our epidemiological model or any population dynamic model given the genealogy. Um, and if we view 
the inference uh, problem like this, um, it actually is quite analogous to a much more general problem in statistical inference in general, of sort of the broad class of um, partially observed Markov processes, um, where we have some underlying process model that describes how our system, oops, keep on changing the slides accidentally. Um, we have some process model that describes how the state variables in our model evolve over time. And we have observations on, huh, I think I'm moving, <laughs> sorry, I think I'm moving around with my mouse accidentally. Um, and then, so we have um, state variables that evolve over time according to some process model. And then we have observations on a subset of these uh, um, state variables. But we don't necessarily observe all the state variables. So we have to have some sort of observation model that relates our observations to the underlying state variables. Um, but in the case of phylodynamics, we don't have observations coming in at discrete times what we have is a genealogy. And what we have to do is relate the genealogy to the underlying state variables in the model. So again, we'll have some population dynamic model that describes how the state variables evolve over time. And then what we have to do is infer um, from at the events that we see in the genealogy or from the intervals in the tree what, the, what these hidden uh, state variables were over time. So again, the problem that we're interested in is inferring what all these latent state variables were over time, as well as the parameters from the genealogy. But in general, this posterior density is um, intractable. And so we have to resort to computational methods to, for sampling from this distribution, like MCMC. Um, and in fact, we could just use a straightforward MCMC algorithm to try and solve this problem. We could, uh, for example, in what I'll call the naive MCMC approach, um, just every MCMC iteration propose new values for our model parameters and our state variables, um, evaluate the posterior probability of those new um, parameters and new state variables, and then accept or reject the proposed uh, values according to some Metropolis-Hastings acceptance uh, probability. Um, but in practice, this sort of naive or brute force MCMC approach almost never works, especially for uh, systems where there's a large number of state variables in our model. In this case, it's basically almost always impossible to design efficient proposal density for the state variables. Um, this is because there's often tight correlations between the different state variables, as well as tight correlations between the state variables and uh, the parameters of our model. Um, and so basically, we'll wind up either making big proposals for our state variables that always get rejected, or making too small proposals for our state variables, uh, which um, don't really move us through state space very effectively. And so we wind up with uh, very low, either low acceptance rates or very high acceptance rates, but always have poor MCMC mixing. Um, but uh, and there's a, this additional problem, too, with this class of models, is that it's often impossible to analytically compute the transition densities needed to compute the posterior density. So basically, what the probability of the system moving from one state to another state is in time, especially for nonlinear stochastic models. Um, so we need some other sort of inference method besides the, the standard brute force MCMC algorithm. Um, and one possibility for this would be to use what's known as a marginal approach or marginal metropolis Hastings sampler, where, again, we're using MCMC, but we simply just sample from the marginal density of the model parameters and then integrate out the unobserved um, state variables. But in order to do this, we actually have to then be able to analytically integrate over all of the latent state variables in our model, this integral here. Uh, which we can rarely actually do. So this, this, this strategy doesn't really get us that far because it's ultimately doomed as well. But it does suggest a way that we can basically cheat. Um, and the way that we can basically cheat is to use what's known as a pseudo-marginal approach, where instead of analytically uh, integrating over the state variables, we can just simulate a number of stochastic realizations from our process model for the population state trajectories. 
and then sum over all of these trajectories um, to compute the marginal likelihood. So basically, under each one of these trajectories, we would compute the likelihood of the genealogy um, given those state trajectories and sum over those likelihoods to compute a Monte Carlo approximation to the marginal likelihood. Um, and then we could just plug this Monte Carlo approximation to um, the marginal likelihood into a Metropolis Hastings step. Um, and we would get an MCMC algorithm that, um, interestingly enough, actually samples from the correct posterior density of the model parameters. Um, and I'll explain a little later on why that's the case. Um, but in practice, this strategy actually almost never works either. Um, and the reason why is that there will be a lot of Monte Carlo estimates, in, or there will be a lot of noise in our estimates of the um, marginal likelihood given by the Monte Carlo estimates, uh, which shouldn't be a problem in theory, but is actually quite a big problem in practice, because what happens is that we might propose a particular um, set of model parameters, and just by chance, those model parameters are assigned a very high marginal likelihood. And so we basically wind up getting stuck in this state where we ha don't have particularly good parameters, but they've just been randomly assigned a very high uh, marginal likelihood, and then we don't accept any of our future proposals. Uh, so we're basically stuck in a state that was assigned, by, assigned a high likelihood just by chance. Um, another sort of limitation of this pseudo-marginal approach is that it doesn't allow for the posterior density of the state variables to be uh, computed, since we're just integrating over it. Um, but the approach that we've taken in phylogenetics, um, which is based on particle MCMC, actually solves both of these approaches, as, as I'll explain now. Um, so uh, a particle MCMC algorithm um, is just a particular version of uh, a more general MCMC algorithm, but we sort of um, embed a particle filter inside of it, as I'll explain below. And so the particular version or flavor of particle MCMC that I'm going to discuss is what's been known as particle marginal metropolis tastings, which is basically the particle MCMC equivalent of the pseudo-marginal approach that we just looked at. Um, and in this particle marginal approach, what we do in the MCMC algorithm is each iteration, uh, we propose a new value for our parameters, our model parameters. And then we propose uh, new values for our state variables by sampling from the posterior density of the state variables given our model parameters and the genealogy using a particle filtering algorithm, which I'll explain in a second. Um, and then we evaluate the posterior probability of the model parameters, uh, or sorry, of the proposed parameters um, by computing the marginal likelihood also as a product of the particle filtering algorithm. And again, I'll explain how this is done in a second. Um, and then we either accept or reject both our proposed parameters and our latent state variables um, through a metropolis hastings step where we just plug in the particle filtering um, a a estimate of the marginal likelihood into the the, the acceptance probability. Um, so, particle filtering. How does this work? Um, particle filtering, also known as... Can I, can I ask yeah. a question Sorry. on the previous slide? Does the proposal of the new theta and the new um, x vector have to happen at the same time? Could those be decoupled, or is there something really important that you need to, to propose them both? Does that make sense? Um, so you could have an, you could have kind of a separate. Sometimes you propose a new theta, and then you do a metropolis hastings to accept or reject. And sometimes you propose a new uh, a new state set of state variables. Um, yeah, so we could um, come up with sort of an MCMC scheme that would sample uh, you know iteratively from one distribution, the distribution of the state variables, um, and then from some other distribution, like the distribution of the the, the parameters like we would do in sort of like a Gibbs sampling scheme. In practice, this almost never works well because, for example, if you imagine making a proposal for a new set of parameters conditional on our current states, you can't move very far in parameter space because we're basically conditioning on a certain set of um, state variables. Uh, so basically, you, you wind up exploring the joint space of the parameter values as well as the state variables very slowly uh, could, because there, there's these strong correlations between the two. So that's why in particle MCMC we don't necessarily have to propose 
the two together. But we actually want to, because we want this joint update on both of our model parameters and our state variables that allow us to uh, take into consideration uh, the correlations between the two and come up with a more effective proposal scheme. Cool. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Uh, um, so yeah, turn on that light real fast. It's getting really dark here. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you guys could see me, but it was getting <laughs> it was getting very dark in here. Um, so, how does the particle filtering work? Um, essentially, what particle filtering is is just a generic method for numerically approximating um, any sort of complex density or sequence of densities, and it works as a form of sequential importance sampling through time, um, which uh, basically means the following. Um, we start out with a set or population of particles, and each particle is assigned um, a particular values of the, the state variables. So for example, at time one, we would initialize our particle population by assigning initial state variables to each one of our particles. So under our SIR model, we would assign each particle uh, values for S, I, and R from some, presumably from some prior distribution. Um, and then we update the particles simply just by simulating the state trajectories of each one of the particles from our uh, process model or our population dynamic model. Um, so then when we get to the second time, each one of our particle states represents a state trajectory up to that point in time. And then we can then weight each one of the particles by the probability of the data, or in our case, the genealogy, given the particle's state trajectory up to that point in time. Um, so we assign particles weights based on the likelihood of the data, given their state trajectories. And here, I'll just um, denote the, the weights by uh, coloring the different particles. So basically, colors with, uh, sorry, particles with um, warmer or redder colors have higher weights. Um, and then after we've weighted the particles, we can just do a round of importance sampling or resampling. And if we sample the particles proportional to their weights, what we'll wind up with is an estimate of the posterior distribution of the state variables given the data observed up into a particular time point. And if we iterate this process through time at each step, updating the particles by simulating from the model and then weighting the particles according to the data that we've observed up to a particular point in time, and then resampling, once we get to the final time step t, we can just weight our particles and sample a single particle based on its weight. And the really cool thing here is that the particle that we sample will just be a random sample from the posterior distribution of the state variables given our complete data set, or in our case, the complete genealogy that we've observed up until time t. So we can just plug the trajectory of one of these particles into step two of our particle MCMC algorithm um, and obtain a sample from the posterior density of the state variables, uh, which we can then use as a proposal for our update on our state variables so we don't have to design a separate proposal distribution for our state variables. Um, so David, uh, I'm surprised that you just take one sample from your particle filter. It gives you a lot of samples, so can you leverage them somehow? Um, well, uh, can I can I answer this in like three slides? Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. You're, you're no, I think it's obvious what question. we're doing with the other particles. So yeah, this would seem wasteful that we're just discarding all of these other particles, but we're actually using the other particles as well. Um, and this happens in step three. So if we're careful, the way that we weight the particles will reflect the genealogy, the likelihood of the genealogy under each one of these trajectories. Um, so at each time step, we compute the likelihood of the genealogy over the preceding interval in the genealogy, uh, conditional on the states of the particles up to that time point. Um, and then if we weight uh, the particles according to these likelihoods, then at any given time point, the particles will basically allow us to approximate the marginal likelihood of that interval over the tree just by summing over the weights or averaging over the weights. Um, and uh, it's, this isn't initially obvious, but it actually turns out that the, um, these weights are independent over the different intervals of the tree. So we can just actually take the product of the, these marginal likelihood estimates over the entire tree to compute the complete 
uh, the marginal likelihood of the full genealogy. So we're not actually um, we're actually using um, our particles to compute this marginal likelihood as well, averaging over the particle trajectories to approximate uh, or get a numerical approximation of the marginal likelihood. And then we can just plug uh, this estimate of the marginal likelihood into our posterior probability uh, for our model parameters, which we then use in our metropolis tasting step to either accept or reject our current proposal for the parameters as well as the state variables. Uh, so to answer your question, Eric, um, we're only sampling a single particle trajectory um, because that's all we need, but we're actually using all of the particle trajectories to get an approximation of the marginal likelihood given our current uh, parameters. Uh, so does, does, that, does that make sense? It makes, yeah, that, that does. Uh, I mean, I, I need to think a little bit about that independence uh, assertion that you made, but uh, I believe you. Uh, well, so the independence uh, assumption, can, you can basically think about it as going backwards in time. Um, the times between coalescent events are exponentially distributed, so it's a memoryless process. And so basically, you can, um, it, it, they are independent going backwards in time. Um, and you can use that backwards time property just to establish their independence in forwards times as well. Um, although that might have just confused you more. <laughs> no, 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 no that, that helps, but it's more just across, because you're taking a product across different uh, particles, right? I, don't, I, I guess it makes sense. Um, um, well, so the particles are interacting themselves because we're doing this uh, iterative process of resampling. Um, but it actually turns out that that doesn't actually um, matter much, that these are basically just creates more random variables that we're going to integrate over, um, which uh, actually I'll explain it again in a couple slides, I think. Okay. So hopefully this will become <laughs> clear in a couple more slides as well. Um, so uh, a few remarks about particle MC or this particular particle uh, marginal metropolis tasting sampler. Um, it provides an exact approximation to the posterior density of our model parameters and our state variables, uh, which isn't uh, obvious at first because we're basically just taking a Monte Carlo estimate of the marginal likelihood that we obtain from the particle filter uh, and plugging it into our acceptance probability. Um, but there's a couple ways of justifying this. Uh, one is sort of uh, how I generally tend to think about why this is justifiable, uh, and it's fairly intuitive. Um, there's error, there's going to be error associated with our marginal likelihood estimates in each iteration of the MCMC algorithm. But essentially, this error in the marginal likelihood estimates gets averaged or integrated out in our encompassing MCMC algorithm. So at any given step of the MCMC algorithm, we might uh, sort of erroneously accept uh, parameters that have would have had uh, a low likelihood um, given the true mar marginal likelihood, but are assigned uh, a higher uh, Monte Carlo estimate of the marginal likelihood just by chance. But that doesn't actually matter in the long run, because we're just as likely to um, accept bad parameters as good parameters. And basically, the noise in the marginal likelihood estimates gets averaged out in the long run. Um, from running the MCMC algorithm long enough. Uh, the more formal justification, which um, addresses your question about the independence um, among particles, I think, a little bit, is that the formal justification for why you can use a particle filtering algorithm inside of an MCMC algorithm uh, to sample uh, state trajectories as well as compute marginal likelihoods is that um, the algorithm operates on this extended state space that includes all random variables used to generate the particles as well as to um, sample the particles. Um, and it just happens that basically this joint distribution over all these random variables collapses down into uh, the marginal likelihood that we're actually interested in targeting, which is the posterior distribution of our state variables and random variables. So essentially, we have all these other random variables that are created by the particle filter, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect our target distribution because we're just integrating out those variables anyways uh, through our MCMC algorithm. Uh, did that make any sense? <laughs> I'm not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't think I can explain it uh, any better. No, uh, yeah. Then, no. Um, I'd be happy. To, maybe we can come up. Or if this question comes up again in the Q and A, I'm happy to uh, take more questions about it. Yeah. Um, I, but I, see that, <laughs> I can see that I'm um, 
running out on my hours, so I'm just going to continue uh, right now. Um, so uh, another few nice features about this uh, particle MCMC approach to doing phylogynamic inference is that it's often possible to get away with using uh, fairly few particles in each iteration of the MCMC algorithm. Um, you can imagine that this sort of algorithm might be uh, extremely computationally brutal because we have to run one of these particle filtering algorithms each iteration of the MCMC uh, algorithm. But in fact, we can um, run uh, the particle filter with quite a small number of particles because, again, it doesn't really matter that we get particular precise or accurate estimates of the marginal likelihoods um, because uh, the, marginal, the error in the marginal likelihoods just gets averaged out anyways. Um, and another really nice um, feature of this algorithm is that it doesn't, uh, doesn't really need much tuning. It pretty much often works just right out of the box. So we don't have to design fancy proposal just to Oh, you're, you guys are still there. Sorry, the video just went out on me. Um, and so in the last few minutes of the talk, I'm just going to discuss a little bit about how these methods can be applied to other phylogynamic models. Um, so in the case that... Yes? Uh, could you reshare your screen? Um, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess not all as well with uh, Google+. Plus. Ah, good. The back? Okay. You're good. Okay, um, so in the last few minutes of the talk, I'm just going to talk about a couple applications where we can use these particle MCMC methods to um, uh, address different problems with other sort of models in phylodynamic, other models in phylodynamics. Um, one issue that has come up recently is that uh, it's not only often difficult to compute these analytical, it's not often always the case that it's, sorry, for birth death models as well as coalescent models, it's often difficult to compute the likelihoods analytically. So for example, for many nonlinear birth death models, we can't analytically compute the likelihood of a genealogy either. Um, but what's nice is that we can basically use the same essential uh, particle filtering or particle MCMC algorithm to uh, fit birth death models as well, even though I've just presented this as a way of fitting coalescent models. Um, in this case, all that we have to do is basically um, change how we weight the particles um, in our particle filter. So instead of weighting the particles according to um, the likelihood of the genealogy under a coalescent model, we would just weight the particles under the likelihood of our birth death model. Um, and this is essentially the strategy that was adopted by my colleague here at ETH, Denise Kuhnhardt, to fit um, nonlinear birth death processes uh, for an SIR type model uh, to genealogies. Essentially what you do is you just simulate a number of particle trajectories which represent your population states. From those trajectories you can then get how your birth and death rates fluctuate over time and then you can plug in those birth and death rates into um, the likelihood uh, equation for under your birth death model. Um, in another application that uh, we worked on recently, we've used these, um, the ability to fit stochastic coalescent models um, to genealogies to compare different methods. So a classic criticism of um, deterministic models, especially deterministic coalescent models, is that they ignore demographic stochasticity, and so there might be some error associated with um, our inferences based on deterministic coalescent models. So what I did with um, my colleagues here at ETH, Veronica Boscova and Tani Stahler, is that we did uh, a little simulation study using these methods to compare uh, the performance of different methods. And what you can see here, uh, what, so what we did was we simulated 100 different random genealogies um, under uh, a forward time birth death model, just under simple exponential growth. And then we asked if we could infer the growth rate of this birth death process using these different methods. And what you can see is that here in the red, deterministic coalescent models often perform quite poorly. Um, the true values here in the black line lie outside of the 95% credible intervals that we get under the deterministic coalescent models because we're not taking into account demographic stochasticity. But if we use... Is the, is the mean okay? Like you could imagine that it's just the CIs that are 
that are wrong. I can't. Oh. It's hard to tell from the, the plot. Uh, so, are you seeing the red lines? Yeah. Can yeah. you just zoom in on the? Is it possible to just zoom in on that PDF? I'm really afraid. That it's okay, 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 okay. Never mind. Yeah. I'm just, can, can you just explain, the, like, point at the different lines and things? No, that's 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 working, kind of. Uh, yeah. no, it's, no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so can you just point at the different bits that we're supposed to see? Okay, so um, is it just that the colors are overlapping too much? Yeah, there's lots of color. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. There, there's lots of colors and they're close together. Okay, so what you should be seeing is that there's um, red lines that represent the 95% credible intervals that we get under our deterministic coalescent models. Yeah. And these uh, red intervals often don't cover the true value ah, okay, okay, okay. of um, growth rate of the population, which is in this black line. Um, but the question is, well, can um, we do better just by adding stochasticity into these coalescent models? Because we know under birth-death models that birth-death models can do quite well recovering the growth rates over time because they naturally consider uh, demographic stochasticity. And so, oh no. <laughs> um, ah. um, What's nice is that we're actually able to then directly compare coalescent models to birth death models in a way in which um, both then take into account demographic stochasticity. And you can see by comparing the red and the blue lines that basically our inferences under both birth death and coalescent models are essentially the same if we uh, incorporate demographic stochasticity uh, into the coalescent models. Very cool. But so you wouldn't want. I don't think the best metric is just are you covering the true value with the 95% CI because you don't want the CIs to be, or the HPDs to be too wide. So if you were just doing that metric, you could make this HPDs really wide and say we'd always we're always covering it. And so you you want it 95% of the time and then 95% HPD, right? Um, yeah. So I mean, there's there's also the issue of precision, right? We want precise estimates as well, and um, what we've seen, um, it's hard to see here, but what we've seen over and over again is that sometimes the birth-death models are able to recover more precise estimates of our demographic parameters than under coalescent models, whether we've included stochasticity or not. Um, and we think this is the case because basically the birth-death models are able to um, exploit additional information coming in from the sample times. So if you can imagine, for example, if um, the sampling fraction is or the number of samples is proportional to the population size, and you know what the sampling fraction is, that there would be additional information coming from the times of sampling. Basically, as the number of samples goes up over time, you know that your population size might also be increasing over time. And so that's why we think that um, it might be possible that um, birth-death models are able to exploit some additional information in the genealogies coming from the sampling times that the coalescent method aren't able to exploit because they just condition on the sampling events. Interesting. But that, that would seem like that would make it a little more sensitive to kind of just sampling biases and, and so on if you if you have too many samples later later in time in the, in the database or whatever. Yeah, if you're interested in this question of how um, sort of uh, misspecifying the, the sampling process affects inference. There's actually um, uh, a paper on archive right now by Eric Foles that looks at this this question uh, in quite a little bit of detail, and it should be published soon. Um, but yeah, he looks at exactly this case of well, how does uh, what happens if we mis misspecify um, the sampling model um, under a birth death model? Uh, and the answer is, in short, as you might expect, that misspecifying the sampling model uh, can dramatically affect our inferences. Um, and so I'm going to end today just by noting that there's also uh, a wide variety of other phylogenetic models we can consider uh, where there might be some sort of population structure in the model. And so lineages can move between different uh, compartments or states in the model. And th therefore, we'll have to take into consideration uh, what population lineages were in backwards through time. Um, and I don't have time to go into these methods in detail. Um, this is the paper if you're interested in how we extended these particle MCMC or particle filtering methods to include um, population structure. But what's really cool is that um, through incorporating population structure into these types of phylogynamic models, we can begin to answer completely 
new and exciting questions. For example, I worked with Eric Foles um, on some HIV data from Detroit and using structured models where we allowed HIV to transition between hosts in different stages of infection, early chronic and like full-blown HIV, we were actually able to estimate how the prevalence of HIV um, in different uh, classes or different stages of infection changed through time. So we could actually infer how many early and chronic HIV cases were in the population over time, as well as being able to estimate uh, stage-specific transmission rates. So we were able to estimate that the um, transmission rate in the early stages of infection was much higher than in the chronic or acute stages of infection. So really we can begin to answer entirely new questions in epidemiology or ecology in general using some of these new valid dynamic methods. Um, but that's all I have for you today. I think this is about the end of my hour. Um, and I'll end by thanking all of you out there who are watching and all of the people who um, helped me out with this work over the year. Uh, especially Katya Cole, who is my PhD advisor at Duke, um, Eric Foles, who um, really sort of helped out, um, helped a lot of these projects along in sort of thinking deep and hard about conceptually how we think about phylodynamics. Um, Oliver Rotman, who helped me out getting some of the uh, particle MCMC and particle filtering methods uh, working early on in my PhD. Um, Tanya Stoller, who is now my current uh, postdoc advisor here at ATH, who also uh, helped out with the comparisons between the birth, death, and coalescent models. Uh, and Veronica Vescova, who's a graduate student here at ATH, who actually did all the hard work of running the simulations for the comparisons between the birth, death, and coalescent models. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, so if folks do have questions, go ahead and type them in the uh, little messaging app. Um, the, it should be on the right-hand side of your your screen. Um, so, do you, do you have any other questions? Uh, go ahead. Yeah. No, uh, I, I mean, I'm actually, I, I mean, I, I sort of already voiced my question. <laughs> so, I, I did have, have one thing, which this was, I actually realized this fairly late when I was doing some particle sort of stuff myself, of how really nice it is that you don't have to use likelihoods uh, in, in doing the filter, where you can just uh, simulate forward, and then take your weights based upon the, the simulation, which mm -hmm. is, is awesome for a lot of these cases. And so you can use it here for these really nonlinear uh, SAR or whatever demographic models. But I'm wondering if there are other kind of classical problems where likelihoods are hard, like maybe selection, that it could be useful for, and if you if you thought about this at all. Well, so I think the problem here is that um, Confusingly, some of these particle filtering methods are often called likelihood-free methods, but we still have to be able to compute the likelihood of the genealogy given our trajectories. We're using the particle filter to uh, integrate out the or integrate over the latent state variables that we don't know how to um, sort of analytically compute their distribution. Um, but there's still likelihood terms, so I think selection is a problem that maybe potentially one day we could apply these methods to, but we would still have to come up with... Um, I, was, I was thinking very simply of the, in the uh, diffusion approximation for selection, you can't, you can't solve that analytically for just the trajectory. And you could do, if you have the trajectory of the, the selected allele, you could put that in with a, a particle filter, perhaps. Oh, really? Uh, I, haven't, I, I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't thought about that application, but yeah, that, I can see how that could potentially be done. I mean, Basically, you would model the, the frequencies of two different alleles in your population as well. Uh, I think the only catch is that there would also then be sort of this problem of uh, the allelic identities of the lineages in your genealogy. You would also have to know which lineages in your genealogy corresponded to what allele, yeah. right? Yeah. You need the uh, structured model or something. It's not getting complicated. <laughs> yeah. And, so, I mean, one simple way that you can incorporate uh, sort of selection or at least competition between uh, different lineages in a phylogeny is that if these different um, lineages actually uh, form different monophyletic clades in your genealogy, you can just split the genealogy up into two independent phylogenies. And basically, you can fit a population dynamic model that allows for interactions among these different um, populations of um, pathogens 
or whatever you're considering, um, by taking into account how competition affects their population dynamics, but considering um, the likelihood of each genealogy separately, given the population dynamics of each uh, of each clone or allele or subtype, whatever whatever is competing in your population. That's cool. But then, so if you you'd see that one kind of one takes off and one declines, but we you you'd be able to actually say that that's that's due to competition between them. Yeah, I mean, I so I've thought a little bit about um, well, what if you have sort of like a classic case of like something like frequency dependent selection, and you saw basically different um, uh, different lineages or different types of pathogens competing through time. Would you actually be able to infer the strength of competition between them um, from how asynchronous their population dynamic cycles are, um, which would be a cool application of these methods. Um, but I think often the problem is we just don't have enough data on sort of different uh, subtypes or uh, different uh, uh, different types of pathogens. Okay. One sort of maybe silly question is um, well, on your like as far as the number of particles you have in your particle filter, I understand that it doesn't need to be big uh, in order to make the algorithm work. But you do you you do get a more accurate marginal likelihood estimate, right? Yeah. It's not biased. So yeah, and um, I mean, in the case of an infinite number of particles, you would actually wind up with, you know, a really good approximation to your marginal likelihood. But so, um, have you, so the trade-off... You've sorry. probably done some sort of trade-off, like, like you've selected 10 particles because it's sort of... It, it does it correspond to other accuracy, the, the other levels of accuracy that you have in your algorithm, or, or how did you choose that number? So... Um, 10 is, the, the number 10 is definitely sort of model specific. Um, I said 10, but that's sort of only relevant to the models that we've looked at so far, which, you know, are uh, stochastic models, but there's not uh, an overwhelming amount of noise in the system. The more stochastic the model is, the more particles you might need to uh, get a good sample from uh, your distribution of your state variables over time. Because while it's not really important to get a, a very accurate estimate of the marginal likelihood, you still run into this problem that I, I brought up for the simple uh, pseudo-marginal case, where you can basically have this problem of what I call the, the jackpot phenomenon. You'll propose a particular set of parameters, and then when you simulate trajectories using those uh, parameter values, you might just get a particular stochastic trajectory that fits the data really well. And that will be given a really high likelihood. So you basically um, wind up with a particular um, parameter proposal getting assigned a very high uh, marginal likelihood just by chance alone. And then you get stuck in that state because none of your proposals that come down the line in the MCMC algorithm will likely have as high as likelihood. Um, and, and you never, yeah, that's right. And you never reevaluate what the likelihood, I mean, likelihood what? It's like if you had run the particle MCMC or the particle filter again, you'd probably get a different likelihood. Yeah. That's easy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the so there is this practical problem of you have to have enough particles to get a fairly smooth estimate of your marginal likelihood. If there's too much variance in your marginal likelihood estimate, you will never get good MCMC mixing. Um, so basically what I do um, to basically figure out the number of particles I need is just... Um, basically run the particle filter a whole a whole number of a large number of times with a particular set of parameters uh, and look at the variance in the marginal likelihood estimates across those different runs of the particle filtering and I basically see uh, where basically the variance begins to asymptote as I increase the number of particles so at some point you sort of only get uh, marginal uh, or incremental increases in the decrease in variance as you add different particles and the question of how many particles you actually need to use is based on sort of uh, when you start getting diminishing returns and the accuracy of your marginal likelihood estimates um, as the number of particles increases. Um, I was just saying 10 because for a lot of problems that we've applied these to, um, 
which are, I think, fairly standard, uh, like epidemiological problems where we might have time series ranging from like 10 to 20 to maybe even 30 years. Um, and we have fairly small population sizes, so there's uh, a fair amount of demographic stochasticity. Even in these cases, we can get away with maybe using 10, 20 particles tops. Um, so I think particle MCMC is still uh, a feasible option uh, for many complex models. Very cool. Do you have any other questions? That's it. That's okay. great. Yeah, um, looks like nobody's written down any questions. Um, wow, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed by sort of the ambition mm -hmm. <laughs> and the execution. So that's pretty cool. Um, thanks. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. It was a, it was a pleasure to do this. Um, yeah, so that's it for this series. Uh, I'm working on pulling together a series about ancestral recombination graphs next. Oh, cool. I won't be talking on those, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Thanks, David. All right, thanks, David. Have a good day. Bye.